We left Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's being pressed. It's the place of the olive press. He's being pressed. He's in agony. He's sweating great drops of blood. He's feeling the effects of becoming a sin offering. He's the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world. So he's sensing a sense of separation from God that is foreign to him. He's never done any sin. He's never um, experienced this before. And he who knew no sin will become sin so we can become the very righteousness of God. In eternity past, God had made this place in time that he would become a man and he would feel the effects of all of the sin of the world and he would take them all upon himself and that he would die. And in that death, he would purchase a price. He would atone for sins. The wrath of God would be satisfied on Jesus, and then he could hand us righteousness. Luther calls it the great exchange. He could give us something we don't have and take away the one thing we could never get rid of. And Christ is settling that issue as he's there, as he's feeling this separation, and he goes to the Father three times and says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, not my will, but your will be done. So he settles his will with God. His will is he's feeling something he's never felt before. And if there's any other way for this, for this to be passed from him, this hour to go, um, all things are possible with you, God. If there's any other way to save mankind, let's go that route. God does not give him an out. Um, so Jesus submits to the will of the Father. He learns obedience. He was always sinless, but he learned obedience in that act, doing something he didn't want to do, doing something that was foreign to him. Um, he will drink the cup of divine wrath that we all deserve. And Jesus feared this cup. And the agony and terror of it is something that is hard to comprehend as holy ground. And Hebrews 2, uh, Hebrews 5 actually says this. Hebrews 5, 7 says this. Who in the days of his flesh, Jesus, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. He feared this cup. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. He took upon himself flesh, and he was obedient in this thing. He went to this, the cross for our sins, and he learned obedience to it. He was perfect. He's the perfect Lamb of God. Now that perfection, that sacrifice, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, obey the gospel. So Jesus did more than suffer on a cross. He paid an eternal debt so that everyone that believes in that perfect sacrifice, he's the author and finisher of our faith. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God. And now he ever leads to intercede for all them that obey that one fact that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. And there's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. And you can't be saved if you're neglecting so great a salvation, what Christ did on the cross for us. And even in the garden. So that wrath will be satisfied. Jesus will pay for the sins of the world. Don't neglect so great a salvation. That's kind of where we left off. Verse 42, he's sitting there in the garden. The guys are sleeping. These guys that are going to start the church. Verse 42, he says, rise up. Let's, let's go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Now Judas has slipped out before he celebrated communion and has gone and sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And he's returned with, with about 500 men. And immediately while he yet spake comes Judas, one of the 12. It's hard to believe one of the 12 would do this to Jesus, isn't it? One of the guys that were with him for three years. And with him, he's made his choice, a great multitude with swords and spears from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. So their, 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 um, their temple guard is with them. Now, Judas has chosen his side at this point. He's chosen the world over Jesus. He's chosen temporary pleasure, money. Um, he's made that choice, and he's never going to be content. In fact, if you look at Judas, he's never content as you go throughout, never satisfied. Um, he's going to wind up killing himself uh, because he's going to feel guilty about betraying innocent blood. But the whole time, his, his life is just one tragic uh, dissatisfaction after another. Now, it seems Judas is real afraid because we get from the other Gospels, he brought a cohort, which is one-tenth of a legion, which is about five to six hundred men. Now, he's seen Jesus raise people from the dead, calm the storm, so he probably feels like, I need more men, like six hundred men. If Jesus wanted to do anything, he says he could have called legions of angels and stopped the whole thing anytime he wanted to. 
The sad fact is, is that Jesus didn't listen to the words of Jesus. And Jesus said, look, you know, I get, I'm the good shepherd. I'm giving my life for the sheep. He didn't have to bring anybody. Jesus is giving his life willingly. He says in John chapter 10, verse 18, it's a free will offering. Nobody takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down and take it up again. This commandment I received of my father. Nobody's taking Jesus' life from him. He is willingly offering it down. He has an option. He does not have to do this. He does not have to go to the cross to save us from our sins. He can say no in real time. Eh -eh, not doing it. He could say that. But he willingly went to the cross for us. It's a free will offering. We just sang, at the cross I bow my knee, where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than what he did. There was a real choice that he made to save you. And he endured. He went through with it. Now, notice that they come at night, too, because all bad stuff happens at night. My dad used to tell me, don't stay out too late at night because all the bad things happen at night. So the whole scene here is like a parable to me. They want to do it in secret. They want to do, every, you know, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. He's going to say, I was in the daytime all the time. You didn't touch me. As I look at our world today, there's a whole lot of things being done in the dark. The older I get, the more scared I get of all the dark things that are going on that I don't know about. One thing is certain, Jesus Christ is the light. And when he shines the light, it's, it's interesting too, he says, I, I'm the light of the world. When he shines that light in our lives, he exposes everything. Whatever makes manifest, the Bible says, is light. It brings it into the open. And if we really know Jesus, we'll bring our lives into the open and our deeds will be exposed to see if they're wrought in God or not. All the things that we, we can't hide from Jesus. Everything will be exposed. Let me read that for you. Luke chapter 12, verse 2 says, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Good, because I have a lot of stuff I, I can't wait to find out about. What's at Area 51 and everything else? I want to know. <laughs> Neither hid that shall not be known. Every, all the little whispers. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in the dark, all the little secrets you told shall be heard in the light. And that which you have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the rooftops. So Jesus Christ, the Bible says, came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to set us free and to shine the light, to drag everything into the light. One day he will drag the Antichrist. He's going to destroy the Antichrist, the Bible says, with the brightness of his coming in Thessalonians. When Jesus Christ comes back, he's just going to light the whole world up. Every eye will see him, and you won't be able to miss it when he returns to earth. It's like lightning flashing across the sky. But this is the hour of darkness, and they're going to try to snuff out that light. And they're going to be successful for three hours. From noon till 3 p.m., the light will go out. The, the sun won't shine. But that's not the end of the story. They're not going to succeed. It says if the principalities and powers knew what they were doing, they wouldn't have put Jesus on the cross because that cross led to our salvation. Oh, they thought they snuffed out the light, but he's going to burst forth from the grave. And he's going to be the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Every, any man or any woman can turn to that light and be saved. They won't succeed because Jesus is the light of the world. And if you follow him, you won't walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. So they're going to try to snuff out the, the, the light. They think they're going to defeat this kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to set up. They are so wrong because Jesus Christ is not only going to set up a kingdom in Israel, he's going to set up an eternal kingdom and give us a home in heaven with him. So a whole new deal is going down. Verse 44, and he that betrayed him had given them a token. Now he, this is the sign that he's going to do, saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, the same is he. He take him and lead him away without trouble or safely. And as soon as he was come, he goes straightway to him and saith, Master, Master, Rabbi, Rabbi. You know, he's, he's calling him teacher, teacher, and he's kissing him repeatedly. So Judas is the great actor, a hypocrite. Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissing him repeatedly. It's typical of the way, you know, Satan operates in our world through infiltration. Many people infiltrate the church, infiltrate groups of Christians, and they pretend to love Jesus, yet all the while they made a deal with the devil. John's gospel, it says, when he does that, Jesus says, whom seek ye? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, I am, and then all 500 guys fall on their back. So that would have been great to see, you know, with their torches in the night, you know, all burning their skirts up. That would, I would have liked to have seen that. It's an important note, too, that you couldn't tell Jesus apart from the rest of the guys. Jesus was one of the guys. Jesus didn't have a crooked staff with a big hat. 
oh, there's Jesus. He's the Pope. He didn't have a big bishop's collar either and say, oh, there's Jesus. Yeah, he's the guy. No, you couldn't recognize him from everybody else. Couldn't recognize him very well. So they needed something to tip him off. He didn't have a sports suit on either or, or a robe or a bishop's robe. He's just one of the guys. He came to be one of us. And he says, master, master. And he starts kissing him. And he's, he's, he's it's a, you know, Judas kiss. It's terrible. What way it is. You know, it doesn't hurt when your enemy attacks you. It hurts when your friends do. When your friends lift up their heel against you or they've, you know, subterfuge. They, they put the knife in the back. Has anybody ever had that happen to them? It hurts a great deal, doesn't it? Somebody you trusted, somebody you went into business with, somebody you, you cared for. Judas has been walking around with Jesus for three years. He knows him intimately. How could he do such a thing? You say it to yourself. Verse 46, and they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. So we know from John that this is Peter. Now, it's illegal to carry a sword on the feast days. You're supposed to check them. If you get caught with them, you can get thrown in jail. But the last message that he heard Jesus say was, you know, I remember when I sent you guys out, I told you you needed to take sword and a stave. Go buy yourself a sword and, you know, get ready when you travel now. Peter just heard that. That's all he heard. So he went to a sword shop, picked himself up a Glock 19 with a couple clips, and he, you know, he's geared up and he's ready to go. Um, when Jesus says, I am, in the name of God, they all fall over backwards. They get back up, and Peter's thinking, this is the time for the kingdom. And he jumps out with his sword. He hasn't. He hasn't practiced. He didn't go to the range at all with it. It's probably brand new. And he misses. And he's aiming for the middle of the guy's head, and he chops off a guy's ear. So we know that this is Malchus. This man is going to come to be a believer later. Um, good thing Peter is a bad aim. Otherwise, we could have got to see Jesus do an even greater miracle as he put his head back together instead of an ear. In Luke, it says, Dr. Luke is very interested in that miracle. He puts his ear, he just ticks his ear up off the ground and puts it back on. Amazing, amazing miracle. So Peter's trying to do everything in the flesh, and as you watch him coming up to this point, you can see his failure coming. He's, he's way overconfident. He says, look, I'll die with you. And Paul would tell us later to have no confidence in the flesh. You know, we can study, we can try to build churches, but if we're trying to do any of that in our own strength, it, it's wood, hay, and stubble, the Bible says. Um, but he's way overconfident. He's gonna, he, his feelings are involved 100%. He believes he's going to, to do this in his own strength. And he's, he just pulled out a sword and chopped the man's ear off. So he means it. His feelings are involved. He's really going to try. He, Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times. He says, no way. He says, Peter, you don't understand. Satan specifically asks for you. He wants to sift you like wheat. He knows what's inside you. And Peter says, no way. And Jesus says, look, Zachariah said, you strike the shepherd. There's a verse that applies to this. Pete, you're all going to run from me tonight. Peter's like, no, that verse doesn't apply to me. My feelings trump your verse, Jesus. Well, go figure. Half a church does that today. Our feelings trump verses. Your feelings do not negate truth. It doesn't matter how hard you feel about something, how much you want it to be true, how much you don't want the Bible to be true about marriage. It does not matter. It will always be true. And uh, you can take my feelings even this, and it really shouldn't be that way, and I really don't want it to be that way. You can say that all you want. Peter's sitting here. He's going to, in his own strength, walk all the way by himself. When everybody leaves Jesus, he's going to find himself right at the middle of Caiaphas' house, right in the middle of the den of vipers. So he really does mean it, and his feelings are really attached, but he's still going to fail. The word of God. Peter here is trying to stop Jesus from going to the cross. And instead of praying, he was sleeping. And now he's trying to stop Jesus from paying for my sins. So I'm so glad Peter failed, to tell you the truth. It says in Matthew, Jesus says this, put your sword away, Peter. Uh, you know, like I don't need your help right now. I don't need your help in the flesh. I could call legions of angels. I could stop this at any moment. I have the power. We know one angel in the scripture can kill hundreds of thousands of people. So he could have called legions and destroyed the whole world if he wanted to. He could have put a stop to it at any moment. He says, I have to. This must needs be. I have to fulfill scripture. So Peter at this point is getting in the way. And now when we act in the flesh, what do we do? We get in the way of what God wants to do, don't we? I can do it. We all can do it. Zeal without knowledge, all that does is it hurts people. It cuts people's ears off. 
And Jesus is going to have to put Malchus' ear back on. So the last miracle Jesus does is he's fixing a disciple's mistake. Now Malchus will become a believer. No thanks to Peter, but thanks to Jesus and his compassion. So the lesson is this. If we use the sword or the things of this world in the flesh to do things for God, if we use the power of this world, we will wind up hurting people and not helping people. See, Peter has to get converted not to learn to trust in his own strength. And the same thing is if we try to build churches in our own strength, they won't amount to nothing. Peter has to learn to use the right sword. Here he's using the wrong sword. He thinks he's going to get things done by his strength. But when he uses the right sword, when he's filled with the Holy Spirit, when he's converted, he's going to go into the book of Acts and he's going to preach a sermon. And he's going to say, you men of Israel... This same Jesus who performed miracles among all of you and showed many signs and proved he was the Messiah, you by the predetermined counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you by wicked hands have taken him and slain him. And those words alone are going to go cut to their heart. The sword is going to pierce their heart, the sword of the spirit. And they're going to say, what do we have to do to be saved? And they're going to get saved. They're going to hear the truth and the truth is going to make those guys free. So in the flesh, we turn people away from Jesus. And, you know, that's always a a problem. And and in my life, I don't want to turn anybody away. I don't want to say anything that hurts people, but I always want to speak the truth. The Bible says this, Jesus was full of grace and truth, right? And the problem with me, I'll speak for myself, not for you guys, either I'm too full of grace and I have no truth, or I'm too full of truth and I have no grace. And you got to have both equally. Truth in love is where we need to go. We can't sacrifice truth for feelings, but we also can't sacrifice the grace and the love of God that's displayed on the cross. So in the spirit, we can cut to the heart and people can get saved. A big difference, a big difference. And, and, and I hope that we realize as we watch Peter's, Peter's descent here. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and with staves to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you took me not. But, underline this, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. In Luke, he says this at this time, this is your hour and the power of darkness. That's where he says that. And they all forsook him and fled. All the disciples take off. So, you got to realize, Jesus isn't a victim at this point. He's fulfilling God's word. He didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to redeem mankind. And Jesus points this out. The word of God will be fulfilled. The word says in Isaiah that he would be crushed for our iniquities. He would be literally, his soul would be made an offering for our sin. He would pay an eternal payment. By his stripes, they're going to whoop him. And they're going to rip the skin off his back. By his stripes, we are healed. We have a propitiation. We all like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. There will be someone who can put their hand on God and put their hand on man, a daysman. Your Redeemer lives, and he's coming, and he'll save the day. And Jesus points that out. Look, the scriptures are going to be fulfilled. They're going to happen. You're coming at me at night with clubs like a common criminal, and you wouldn't touch me in the daytime. But it's your hour. This is your time. This is the power of darkness. Have at it. And the forces of darkness hate the light, and they will always hate truth, and they will always hate light. Remember this. Character is what a man does in the dark. What you do in the dark proves who you really are. Like I can get up here, and I can try to teach a sermon, and I can study But who I really am is going to come out in the little trials that I have each week. What I say, what I look at, who I listen to. When nobody's around and nobody sees the decisions I'm making, when I choose for the Lord, I'm choosing light. I'm choosing truth. And I'm winning the day if Jesus Christ lives in me and that light shines out of me. I don't walk in darkness, but I have the light of life. Thy word, the Bible says, is what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can tell folks who love the Lord by how they love the word of God and how they love truth and how they respond to truth. It brings out our lives when we, walk, when we bring them into the light. Anything that doth make manifest, the Bible says, is light. It shows us what we are. And when we bring our deeds out into the light, it will see if they're wrought in God or not. 
we'll be able to get a good idea of what and who we're living for when we bring our deeds into the light of the word of God and into the power of his spirit and we lay our lives bare before the Lord and we see who we really are which is sinners and we receive the grace of God our lives will be transformed and they will be changed walk in the light as he is in the light the Bible says they want to snuff out that light they want to get rid of the light people in the world today they don't want you to hear about the light they are obfuscating truth at every turn. Like Pilate, I watch the television and I say, what is truth? I'm cynical. When I open my Bible, I'm cynical no longer. I have truth, and the truth makes me free. For three hours, the light will go out from noon to 3 p.m., but the story isn't over. Jesus will rise again. He will burst forth from that grave. And this same Jesus is both Lord and Messiah, and he's alive forevermore. Praise God. The scripture must needs be fulfilled, and they all ran away. But the story isn't over. Jesus Christ is going to rise again from the dead. Fear not, Jesus says in Revelation, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Praise God, right? He's at the right hand of the Father right now. Amen, exclamation point. And I have the keys of hell and death. Hallelujah. I don't need to fear death any longer. My Redeemer lives, and he's got the keys. And he's opened up heaven. So that man, man can come in. He's giving good gifts to men, the Bible says. Jesus will defeat the darkness and take the keys. Hebrews says this, and I'll read it for you because it's such a, a good. Anybody afraid to die? You should be terrified if it wasn't for Jesus. Verse 14, Hebrews chapter 2. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us. We have to die. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, dying a perfect, living a perfect life and dying that death, Jesus, he might destroy him that had the power of death, the devil, that is Satan, amen? He no longer has a hold on us. He set the captives free. He's given good gifts to men. He went down and he proclaimed, dangled the keys of victory to those that were disobedient, it says in Peter. And he led captivity captive and took us to heaven. And Satan no longer has the power of death to make us fear death. We have the power that right now says that he's destroyed the power of death and we're going to have life forever with Christ. He's destroyed that fear. We no longer have to fear or mourn like others mourn who have no hope. We have a hope. And deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We no longer fear death because Jesus Christ has defeated death. Amen? Amen. Muhammad's dead. Buddha's in a pot. Everybody else is dead. But we got a living Savior who went into death, defeated death, burst back out of the grave, and now says he can take us to heaven if we only believe in him. That's the only thing you have to do is believe on him who God sent. And don't fear, he's the first and the last. He's got the keys. I love, Jesus got the keys. So when I die, I don't have to be afraid. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's with me. He's going to open up heaven for us. He's coming back again in power and great glory. The scriptures are going to be fulfilled. He's going to return to the Mount of Olives and split it into two and defeat the darkness once and for all. I can't wait for that. And it says in the scripture that he's going to be the light that shines. They don't need no sun anymore. That's how bright Jesus is. What a comfort to me. The scripture must needs be fulfilled. Underline that because that tells you that all the scripture will be fulfilled. Verse 51. And there followed him a certain young man. This is a very interesting verse, only uh, exclusive to Mark. I'll tell you what I think it is. and you, I'll just tell you what I think it is. Having, you don't have to believe me. Having a linen cloth cast about his naked body and the young man laid hold on him. And the young man... I'm sorry, the young man, young men, that means the, 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 the guys with the spears and the swords, they, they laid hold on him, he left the linen cloth, and he ran away naked. So, interesting two verses here. There's a young guy that pops up. He's half clothed, and he's, he, as soon as he sees him, they get ready to touch him. They grab his cloak, and he runs back naked. Now, many people believe that this is John Mark. Mark wrote this uh, gospel, this um, gospel of, of Mark. But under Peter's guidance or tutelage most people believe now they believe this is john mark as a young boy now we know from acts that the disciples would meet at john mark's mom's house whose happens name, name happens to be mary as well and that's where they had prayer meetings and that house was in jerusalem many people think that 
the communion, the Passover that Jesus just had was at that house or at a house very close by. Put it this way. If it was even on the same area, anybody on that block would have seen five or 600 soldiers coming to that house first, correct? Many people think Judas left the communion, went to go get, uh, sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver and take 500, 600 men back to that place that they were having, the upper room where they were having the Last Supper. They didn't find him there, and John Mark wanted to warn Jesus and knew where they went, and he ran there to go warn Jesus. Soon as the soldiers show up, he's terrified, he's afraid. They grab his cloak, and he runs away naked. So he's inserting himself here, telling you, telling you that I was there and that I was afraid to, and they caught me, and I ran home naked. The best explanation I got for you, so if you come up with a better one, let me know. It's a nice little preface, too, to Peter's failure, though, actually. As you look at it, John Mark is telling his own fault before he gets to Peter's. Verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants, and he warmed himself at their fire. So Peter is following afar off, far enough so nobody can... can can see him, or he's trying to be incognito like an undercover guy, um, but close enough so that he keeps his promise to Jesus. And as a matter of fact, their eyes are going to lock when he denies them, and Jesus is going to be looking at him. The last time he denies him, they're going to catch eyes, and Jesus is just, and Peter's just going to lose it, and he's going to start start to weep. The high priest already has all the leaders there. These are 71 men. The Sanhedrin is already gathered, so this is a conspiracy. They are already at the house. They are ready to try Jesus, um, and they're breaking uh, many of their own laws. They're not allowed to have a trial at night. Every trial is supposed to be during the day. That law is broken. They're not supposed to have a trial in somebody's house. That's not allowed. They're supposed to give 24 hours before they make any sentence uh, um, um, mandatory. So they're having this at Caiaphas' mansion. Any false witness that comes and gives a false witness is supposed to be punished by death. And there's a lot of false witnesses, and none of them die. So the whole thing is a kangaroo court. Criminals are in charge of the Justice Department here. Um, Caiaphas is a total criminal. So Peter, at this point, you got to give him credit. He is very brave at this point. He makes it all the way to Caiaphas' courtyard by himself. The other guys have ran away. So we're watching Peter's progressive downfall. We see this is all in his own strength, all in his own feelings. He's trying really hard. And in the flesh, you've got to give him credit. Peter is brave. Peter has hacked the man's ear off, and he's still following Jesus. You know, once you, once you shot somebody, you probably run. You're not going to go to where all the people are that can arrest you. But Pete goes all the way there. And as you look at him, you just watch his fall, and you, you have to take these things to heart because it's, it's the progression that we all, I don't know, has anybody ever backslidden? All right, so the rest of you are front sliders then. <laughs> See, if you never backslid, then you front slide. So if you can't say you ever backslid, then you front slided into legalism, and you're better than everybody else. Okay. I've backslidden. I try not to anymore. Every time you sin, you backslide, in essence, in thought, word, or deed. But you see, and first things first, he starts arguing with Jesus. And lots of times we look at the Bible, we start to argue with the Bible, or God's word doesn't apply to me. That verse doesn't apply to me. He's continually arguing with the other disciples about who's the greatest, who's the greatest. He's always at the center of those arguments. He promises to die with Jesus. He promises loyalty. He's way overconfident, and he doesn't pray. He doesn't pray. Then he acts out in the flesh. He hacks a man's ear off. Jesus has to rebuke him and put the man's ear back on. Now he's following afar off. He's far away. The others have ran. Now he is alone. He's all by himself. And that's where the devil wants to get you. He wants to get you all alone. You're easy pickings, man, if you're all alone. The Bible says we should. I'm not saying you have to gather here, but you should have a group of believers you can gather together with and be accountable to. Because if you're by yourself, you're easy pickings for the enemy. He's become prideful, started his little faction, finds fault in others, doesn't pray, and then he starts to follow afar off until he's isolated. You know, we see that in people today. I ain't going to church. I love Jesus. I'll keep him in view, but at a distance. I don't want any. They're all a bunch of hypocrites and phonies. And I tell you this, too. If you can't find the perfect church, you know, most people say, I can't find the perfect church. You know, there's no perfect church. There is no perfect church. And if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. 
Because you ain't perfect either. I'll keep Jesus at a distance. I love Jesus. He knows I love him. And then you start to live in the flesh. You start to live in your own strength. Pretty soon, you're back to the place that you were before you got saved. And you're sitting at the same fire with the same people that God saved you out of. I can remember when I first came to the Lord, six months in, you know, I remember going back to the bar. Some of my old friends said, oh, yeah, didn't you do your, your Jesus day? And I was sitting there, and I could just feel the eyes of Jesus on me the whole time, and I knew this is not my place anymore. This is not where God wants me. And the eyes of Jesus were on me, and my friends are my so quote unquote old friends. They, I gave myself away. I'm sitting there trying to witness to them with a Budweiser in my hand. You know, like that's going to help. Barroom evangelism, don't go there. And you're looking for a little comfort in the world. You're looking for a little bit of that old friendship, or you're trying to find comfort in the world, or you're following Jesus at a distance. You will be miserable. It won't work out for you. The people at the fire won't accept you. And then Jesus' eyes will lock with you and you'll feel like you let your Lord down. It's a miserable place to be following Jesus afar off. Don't do it. It's a terrible way to live. Verse 55. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witnesses against Jesus to put him to death and they couldn't find any. Yeah, it's hard to find a witness against God, that's for sure. Many bear false witness against him, but their witnesses agreed. They couldn't find, you need, in the mouth of three witnesses, something needs to be established, but they couldn't find anybody that agreed, two or three, at least need two. But none of them could have the same story. They couldn't get their story straight. So we have the whole Sanhedrin, 71 members, hunting for witnesses against Jesus, searching for liars to bear false witness, and there's no uh, shortage of liars. There's always folks willing to get favor with powerful people and lie to you and to tell you stories that aren't true. So they lie for gain. All we have to do is look at the mainstream media today. It's exactly what's going on. Propaganda goes out into the world. It's easy to find somebody to lie. You pay them enough money. They can't find any fault with Jesus, so there's a lot of liars get up, but none of them agree. None of them can keep their story straight, and it's a bunch of fake false accusations. Verse 57, there arose certain, now in Matthew it says two, and bear certain men, and they bear false, two men it says in Matthew, and bear false witness against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their way. They couldn't even really get that straight, he says. So in Matthew, it says there was two guys who bring a story with, a, with some truth to it. Uh, they change a few of Jesus' words, though. They actually switch it up. They switch it around to make it an entirely different meaning. Jesus said, destroy this temple. He's never said, I will destroy this temple. So no, no, I will there at all. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Speaking of his body, it says in John. Speaking of his, his physical frame. They say that he said, I will destroy this temple, meaning the temple in Jerusalem, which is sedition, and he can be killed by the Romans for that. He certainly didn't say, I will destroy the, the God's temple. He was speaking of his body. They added to his word. They added small parts to his word, I will. It's funny, too. The Jehovah's Witnesses add one word to the Gospel of John to tell you that Jesus is an angel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was... Oh, we're going to put an A in there, a God. And our scholars tell us there's an A God. So if it's a God, there must be other gods. So we must be talking about an angel, Jesus, an angel, he's archangel, Michael, and send a story. Really? That's how Satan operates. We'll just change one word. We'll just change one word, and we'll make it say something totally different. He was speaking of his body. They added to his word, and that's what Satan does all the time. He adds to the word. He takes away from the word of God. And the Bible's clear about that. We don't want to add to it or take away from it. When we go through it, we want to read it. We want to read it in context, and we want to let the word speak for itself. It means what it says, and it says what it means. And if we're going to throw it away on the altar of, of some kind of, uh, you know, feelings, and we're going to throw it away because we want it to say this, because we'd rather it say that instead of this, then we're doing damage to God's word, and we're doing Satan's work, actually. And we never want to do Satan's work. Let the word of God speak for itself. Check me out. Don't ever take what I tell you for the gospel. You read the word. You know where I'm going next week. You know what I'm reading. You should have your little Greek thesaurus. You have the blue letter Bible. You could go through it and write your own translation. There should be no reason 
why you don't know what the word of God says. They want to destroy us. They accuse Jesus of, of wanting uh, terroristic threats. He wants to take down the temple. Never said that. Changed a couple words. But they couldn't even get their story straight. They had a hard time keeping their lie consistent. Verse 60, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against these guys are testifying all this stuff against you, and you're not going to say a word? But he, Jesus, held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Messiah, the son of the praise, the son of the blessed? When they say son of the praise, they're speaking of Yahweh God. Art thou, in other, in other gospels, it's the son of God, the son of the praise, the son of the blessed. They definitely knew what he was talking about uh, when Caiaphas got up and tore his clothes and said, are you, I adjure you by the most high God, answer me. Are you the Messiah? So the trial's not going well for Caiaphas at this point. And Jesus need, sees no need to defend himself against a bunch of liars who can't get their story straight. I don't know about you guys, but I'm from Philadelphia. When anybody's accusing you of something you haven't done, do you just keep your mouth shut? I automatically want to fight back. We're great at that in Philadelphia. It's like a pastime, accusing each other and defending ourselves. <laughs> Jesus could have mounted the most great, greatest defense ever. Nobody spake like Jesus spake. He could have turned around and looked at Caiaphas and said, Caiaphas, I know how much money you've robbed from everybody in this room. I know how many wives you've had. I know of all the sin in your life. He could have, he could have laid Caiaphas to the ground. Caiaphas was a louse. Even the Romans didn't like Caiaphas. He bought his position as high priest. When Titus Vespasian comes in in 70 AD and, and, and they, they raid his house, they find tons of gold and silver buried there. This guy was robbing people hand over fist. He's a phony religionist. Jesus could have laid into him. But Jesus keeps his mouth shut. And I like what Mark Twain said. He said this, never argue with an idiot. They will drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. And I 100% agree with Mark Twain on that. The problem is, is I get caught up in that. I want to defend myself. And I become an idiot arguing with another idiot. Sometimes it's better just to be, keep your mouth shut. But Jesus being silent wasn't just, he was just trying to be cool. He was actually fulfilling scripture there as well. It says in Isaiah, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't open up his mouth. When he gets beat and they lay the lash on his back and they rip the skin off, they're going to see the inside of his body. And that was designed in the Roman culture to make that prisoner confess. Who's in on the crime? Give up your disciples. And Jesus didn't say a word. When they ripped that skin off his back because he would have had to say, you're in my name too because we were all there and he was taking that for us and he didn't open his mouth up. Like a lamb before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was quiet because if he opened up his mouth, he'd be implicating the whole human race. And he'd still be implicating the whole human race. So the Lamb of God is brought before these religious leaders. They're just supposed to inspect the Lamb at Passover. Everything is exactly fulfilling Scripture. They're looking at the Lamb of God, and they ask him a great question. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of the living God? The high priest put him under an oath. I adjure you by the living God. Tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? And that was the question. And everyone that heard Jesus knew that he, he claimed to be the Messiah. They saw the miracles he did. They all came away. This must be the son of David. This must be the Messiah. They knew his claims. I mean, Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And they knew he meant God. When they got ready to stone Jesus, what did they say to Jesus? For a good work, we're not stoning you. But because you being a man, we see you're a man, you're a man. You being a man, you're making yourself out to be equal with God. That's why we're going to stone you. Not for doing good works, but because you're saying you're God. He said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. I'm going to give my life for the world. I came from heaven. I preexisted Abraham. I am the God that talked to Abraham. I'm the God that talked to Moses in the burning bush. That's me. And that's why they wanted to kill him. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've what? You've seen God. That was his claim. Jesus and God are one. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. 
They want to get a charge against him of blasphemy, so they ask him straight out under oath, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed? Now, how can you put God under oath? That's pretty hard, right? Who's he going to swear by? We say, I swear to God. Who does God swear to? Interesting. He swears to himself. It says this in Isaiah 45, 22. He says this. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. That's all of us, every Gentile, every person that's ever lived. We can look unto who? Yahweh God. I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall we not return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Ultimately, everyone will be judged on how they answer this question. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the Messiah? Is he the son of God? Is he the only one that can put their hand on God and man and give us salvation? Neither is there salvation found in any other. Is he the one that has paid the debt for each one of us that is sitting in this room and offers up us eternal life? Is he the one that can shine light into your life and move into your heart and commune with you and change your life and give you a new nature? Is he that Messiah? I pray you all meet him. And I pray that you ask him to be your Lord and Savior because his hand still goes out the day and he's still knocking on the door. Ultimately, everyone will be judged by him. Every knee will bow. Jesus answers the question for us, though. Many people will tell you Jesus never says that he's God or the Messiah. They're wrong. Verse 62. Let's read it. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed? What does Jesus say? I am. What does that mean? He is. And there's only one, right? That's Jesus. So that's the word of God, right? There is no other Messiah. And there will be no other Messiah. Oh, the world will put their Messiah up there, another Christ, but this is the only one. This is the real McCoy. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Interesting verse. He says, I am, the title for God. He takes the scripture and David says, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies become thy footstool. And he places it together with a passage in Daniel that they're all familiar of. Daniel 7, 13 says this. I saw in the night visions, this is Daniel, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall never be destroyed, which shall not be destroyed. So Jesus is looking at this guy, this high priest who has the power that day to put him under an oath, and asks him under his name, his under the name of God, which is Jesus standing in front of him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And he says, I am. And you're going to see me sitting on the right hand of power. I'm going to be seated there, and I'm going to come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and I'm going to have a kingdom that's never, ever going to end. So he's a, proclaiming that there's a day coming when he will be the judge and not the judged, when the prisoner will become the potentate. When the guy standing there being judged by this world and the sin of the world, he, that same Jesus will be both Lord and King forever and ever. The suffering servant will be the conquering king. Make no mistake, Jesus Christ will come in judgment. John 5 says this, 22. Let me read this for you. For the Father judges no man. What does that mean? When you see God, or when you get your moment before God, when you die, guess who you're going to be talking to? Jesus. For, as the, for the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto who? Jesus. That all men should what? Honor the Son even as they honor God. So what he's saying is, you better honor Jesus as you honor God, as God. Jesus better be God in your life. If you don't honor Jesus the way you honor the Father, then you're not honoring God. He that honoreth not the Son doesn't honor the Father which sent him into the world. That how you respond to Jesus is how you respond to God. If you don't want Jesus, you don't want God. That's what he's saying. If you don't honor Jesus as you would honor God Almighty, that means any religion that was ever created that does not honor Jesus as God is a satanic false system. Tells you right there. Jesus is claiming to be the only one and only God man. 
Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The tables will be turned. Nobody's going to get an opportunity when Jesus comes back to say, I want to make a decision now. Today is the day that you make the decision and you stand, but whether you're going to believe that or not, whether he is the one or not. Where will you fall on that judgment day when Jesus Christ comes back? When all of mankind will bow before Jesus, all the angels will too. Everything in heaven, under the earth, and on the earth, every knee will bow. For some of us, Jesus will return with the voice of the archangel, with a shout, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And we will stand before the beam of judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Some of us will suffer loss and some of us will get rewards. But we will all get to heaven based on the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And the fact that we accepted his gift of salvation. And we will be judged there. The rest of the world will be judged at a great white throne. And many will be judged when he puts his foot back down on this planet. And he comes in the clouds with power and great glory. Caiaphas will stand before Jesus and give an account for not recognizing his God and not owning him. He came in judgment. He's been given authority, authority, the Bible says, to execute judgment. Jesus will say this, marvel not at this. There's a day coming when all that are in the graves will hear my voice. Some will raise to everlasting life and some will raise to everlasting damnation. So that light will shine. That light will shine. Where will you be when it does shine? If you come here week in and week out and you heard the message of Jesus Christ and his love for you and the love that God, like when, if you can go through the Garden of Gethsemane and you can't see the love of Jesus for you and you can't see that he bore all of that sin on a tree and rose again from the dead and offers you eternal life, if you neglect that, if you turn away from that, one day the light will come crashing into this world and the darkness will have to flee. Every foul spirit, every satanic power, they will be put down and the light will shine forever. Now is the day to walk in the light. Now is the day to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because there might not be a tomorrow. There might not be next day. It's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. So you, today, you have a choice. You can't follow the law and be a good person and expect to get to heaven because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's only one righteous, and that's Jesus Christ. And he sits at the right hand of the Father. Go to him today. Ask him to be your Savior. Ask him to bear you from above and join the family of God so that when that light does come crashing in, and it should crash into your life right, right then when you get saved, but when that light invades this world, there'll be no place to hide. And I don't care how you flip the scripture around or what words you put in there. When the word comes, what are you going to say then? Are your fancy arguments going to stand up at that point? No, they're not. Are your religious principles like Caiaphas, oh, all that power, where is he now? We need to take these things to heart. The high priest is going to rent his clothes and say, what need we have of any further witness? You've heard the blasphemy. Jesus, he, they're saying he's a blasphemer, and they all condemned him to be guilty of death, and Jesus is going to die for us. We'll talk about Peter next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. And pray that we would walk in the light. And if you know anybody that's not saved, do yourself a favor, pray for them specifically right now. And if there's anything in you that needs to be drug into the light, ask the Lord to do that right now, and we'll pray. Father God, we lift our hearts to you. Lord, we know you've overheard. Lord, we're thankful that we can come here and we can meet in this place and we can sing songs and we can open up your word and we can read it plainly. Lord, we know you claim to be the Messiah, the anointed one sent of God. We know that you defeated death and you rose again from the grave, the receipt paid in full, and you've led captivity captive. And Father, we're so grateful that we have a home and an abundant inheritance in heaven reserved for us. And we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, which is the very word that we read today of your love for us. We're grateful, Lord. We pray that your light would shine in, abroad in our hearts, Lord, and we might be able to redeem the time that we have left. We might be able to win our friends and loved ones to you, Lord, by being filled with grace and truth. Lord, that the words that come out of our mouth, Lord, would be from you. And that in the flesh, Father God, that we, we, Lord, we can't do anything you said without you. Nothing 
can be done unless you do it in and through us. Lord, I just present myself to you once again. Lord, I ask you to fill me. I ask you to use me. I ask you to make me a man after your very heart, Lord. Watch over every person in this room, Lord. Use us for your kingdom, Lord. We want it. We want to produce good fruit, Lord, with the time that we have left. And Lord, we're really excited about your return. So any moment's great with us, Lord. You can come back. But Lord, until then, Lord, grow us in grace, Lord, the knowledge of who you are. And use us, I pray in your name.